At 42 million. The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. So, thank you very much. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. This is it. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Oh, my goodness. Every case is packed with surprise and intrigue. Is it or isn't it a Freud, then? But not every painting is quite what it seems. Gosh, why didn't I notice that before? It's a journey that can end in joy. There is enough to support the conclusion that it is by Tom Roberts. <laughs> or bitter disappointment. I don't think it's a work by Gauguin. I'm very sorry. This time, could a work discovered buried in the brambles of a Norfolk back garden be by celebrated sculptor Henry Moore? If it is, it could be worth a fortune. My God, there's a lot of state with this one, isn't there? Our investigation takes us on the trail of Henry Moore through Norfolk to his home in Perry Green to discover how he created his masterpieces. Could it be? the starting point yeah. that then becomes yours. What a thought. What a thought. But there's a forgotten artist in the frame. The first thing I've got to ask you, do you recognise it's one of your mother's works? Will science help us solve the mystery? Well, 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 this is a surprise. It's now, I think, more important than ever to work out what it's made from. We're on the road, heading east to the beautiful county of Norfolk, a place of inspiration for so many artists. This week's case brings us to the medieval city of Norwich. We've come to meet a couple who'd like our help to investigate a mysterious work of art. Hello. Oh, hello. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to see you. Should we have a look at your sculpture? Neil and Barbara Betts have invited us to see a curious sculpture they've owned for over 20 years. They hope it might be an undiscovered masterpiece. This is Henry. Henry? And why is he called Henry? Well, we have a, a very dear art historian friend, and she remarked that he was very much like a Henry Moore sculpture. So from then, he became Henry. Gosh, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to add more to the name Henry? Because Henry Moore is one of the leading sculptors of the 20th century, influential, much collected, and you have a, a, an intriguing-looking object here that has some of the characteristics of this great man. Henry Moore is one of the biggest names in the history of art. Born in 1898, he was the son of a Yorkshire miner who rose to international fame to become one of the most celebrated sculptors of the 20th century. He was inspired by the way natural and organic objects could be transformed into art. His monumental bronzes can be seen all over the world, and his works can sell for millions. Could this piece actually be by the great man? Its story begins in 1987, when Neil and Barbara's former neighbors asked for help to clear their garden at a place called Mergate Hall. I went there with the strimmer and I kept catching certain items and then eventually I came across this. What, you just and sort of hit him with the strimmer? Yeah, <laughs> hit him with the strimmer. And so um, we got the wheelbarrow out, put him in and took him to the house and that's where he stayed as a doorstop for years. As a doorstop? As a doorstop. Henry stayed at Mergate Hall until their neighbour, Mr Williams, passed away. Mrs. Williams moved to a nearby barn conversion, and Neil and Barbara cared for her until her death in 2000. They had no idea what was in store for them. I got a phone call from the executors and said, um, Mrs. Williams has left you the barn and everything in it. So she left I... you her entire yeah. home and contents? Yeah. Wow, but it speaks volumes about what your relationship with her was. I mean, that's so touching mm. that she obviously felt... Yes. What, did she feel you were, you were like family to her? Well, she actually told the um, staff, or the nurses and everything, that I was her son, oh. uh, that she never had. Oh, that's um, lovely. 
It was a big shock, as you can imagine. Um, so that was how um, Henry came to us. Henry was there. So Henry came to live with you, and then what did you do with him? Well, we had a water feature in the garden, so I decided to put a pipe up his back to the top of his head, <laughs> and water would flow over it, and he was there in the garden for <laughs> quite some time. And I did actually look into melting him down as well. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. Shame on no. you, shame it's on you. It's all coming out now. I'm sorry to say that, but I did. Oh, my oh. god! I weighed him and worked out how much he might be worth. I think it was £50. Pounds. £50, pounds, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you rue the day that you considered melting this down, because I reckon that is a first, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're off to a promising start because Henry has already caught the interest of the Henry Moore Foundation. We sent all the photographs and any data that I'd got on it, sent them through to them, and um, they came straight back to us and said, um, it's very, very interesting, and would you like to put it to the panel? I mean, that's a very significant step forward because the Henry Moore Foundation get hundreds of inquiries every year from people hoping they might have a, a genuine Henry Moore, but only about 30 or 40 get put through to the review panel, and that is the panel that decides whether or not it is a genuine Henry Moore or not. In the eyes of the art world, they have the Roman emperor's power to say yes, yes. or no. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you want us to do now, then, is make the strongest possible case exactly, yeah. for the Henry Moore Foundation then to consider. Yes. Well, if we can prove that this is a one-off, not, not one of a series, but a, a unique object by a, a much-loved, highly-regarded sculptor of the 20th century, we could be talking in excess of half a million pounds. Who, who knows? Could even be a million pounds. Wow. Up to a million? That's extraordinary. Absolute shock. This is Henry. The doorstop. The water feature. The water feature. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, but as always, there's a flip side to this. So if it's not accepted as a Henry Moore, well, it might only be worth a couple of thousand pounds. We say on Fake or Fortune, so often there's a lot at stake. But my God, there's a lot at stake <laughs> with this one, isn't there? The difference between it being accepted as Henry Moore or not is just massive. And it's also quite awe-inspiring to think that he could have been made by mm. him. Mm. I think yeah. that's the bit that I find mm. quite intriguing is that he could have actually done that. Well, whether it is by Henry Moore or not, either way, it's a lot more than 50 quid if you'd melted it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my finest moment. <laughs> the first stage of our investigation is to examine the physical evidence. I'm taking a closer look at the sculpture. On first setting eyes on this, the feeling I get is of presence, a feeling of power in a way, of going back to the dawn of time. You know, this is part bone, it's part fossil. It's trying to express something frightening, perhaps. And then when you begin to break it down into its component parts, you can see elements that you associate with Henry Moore, this great solid, bone-like structure here, slightly angled at the top. And then beneath that sharp, expressive tooth, I've seen something similar to that before. And then a, a, a very Moorish touch, what looks like a hip bone, this rather gentle, rather beautiful, hollow. There are elements which, although I haven't seen them put together in this way, reminiscent of Henry Moore. One thing I find curious is its colour. Now, when I think of Henry Moore, it's bronze, it, it's that sort of browny, yellowy hue. And this is silvery. It's not the colour I associate with him. That needs to be explained. I have to say that it's really impressive. I find myself rather blown away by it. I'm keen to know what Neil and Barbara have managed to discover so far. So you found Henry with your strimmer yes. in the grass at Mergate Hall. And have you managed to do any research into how it might have got there? Well, uh, um, yes, I knew that the, um, the lady who owned the property before was a lady called Betty Jewson. She was an artist 
and she had lots of um, famous artist friends. And what kind of artist friends? Well, we did a bit of research and we actually found an article which is on there on the local uh, history website. All right, so she was an accomplished artist, especially in sculpture and painting, and a member of the Women's International Art Club. Henry Moore was one famous name who visited the hall on a number of occasions. He already had connections to the area, as he often visited his sister, who lived in Mulbarton in the 1920s. Gosh, what did you think when you saw that? Um, shock again, I think, really, because it was the first real connection that we had. Yeah. Um, so it was great optimism, I think, when we saw that. One thing that slightly rings alarm bells is it says she, Betty Jewson, was an yeah. accomplished artist, especially in sculpture exactly. and painting. Exactly. So yeah. that's got to raise a possibility possibility that it's, it's a sculpture by Betty Jewson yes. and not by Henry Moore at all. Yes, exactly. That wouldn't be quite so no. good, would it? I mean, if it turns out that it is a Henry Moore, how will you feel about him? I can't even think like that. No, I can't think like that. It's just too big a yes, thing to try yes. and take in. Yeah, yeah. Far too much. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see what we can find out. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait. I've come to Perry Green in Hertfordshire on the trail of Henry Moore. This is where the artist lived and worked from 1940 until his death in 1986. Today, it's home to the Henry Moore Foundation, which safeguards his legacy. The network of studios where his greatest masterpieces were conceived have been carefully preserved. And in the gardens, Moore's monumental bronzes are displayed in nature as he intended. There's no better place to gain an understanding of the great sculptor, to steal a glimpse into the creative workings of his mind. Surrounded by Moore's strange organic shapes and abstract forms, I want to see how Neil and Barbara's piece compares to these genuine works. And there's one colossal sculpture that I find particularly compelling. I always think the key to understanding Henry Moore is to realize that his particular artistic truth was all to do with the core of things, the raw, the elemental, you know, getting down to the meaning of life as he saw it. And this is a brilliant example of that. It's called three-piece vertebrae. And at first glance, these are the crucial bones to an animal or a human. And yet, the more you look at them, so they seem to change. I mean, yes, they are bones, but also they feel like stone. Is it reaching far back into some sort of Neolithic imagery or symbolism? So the question is, do we see in this epic piece here any echoes, any resonances in Neil and Barbara's piece? Well, I suppose, the most obvious thing to point out is that central sort of spur-shaped nub in the middle, which in Neil and Barbara's sculpture, it's a little bit more nose-shaped, but you, you can see they're related in some way. And then there are these thrusting upward points, almost like embryonic teeth. Well, we've seen something very similar in Neil and Barbara's piece. And taking it as a whole, the sort of turning, undulating, nature and feel of bone. We see something very similar in Neil and Barbara's sculpture. Just in visual and aesthetic terms, there's enough similarities going on for me to want to know more. I'm heading out of Norwich on the trail of this intriguing sculpture. If it is by Henry Moore, how did it end up in the Norfolk countryside? To find out, I've come to the place where it was discovered, a fine medieval manor house, Mergate Hall. This is where the artist Betty Jewson lived from the 1930s until her death in 1981. According to local history, Henry Moore visited on several occasions. Eleanor Chubb now lives at Mergate Hall. She's agreed to help me find where the sculpture was discovered. Hi there. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. What a beautiful place. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely lovely. Now, I've got a map here okay. that Neil has given me. X marks the spot, and it 
I think it leads over there. Yes. Shall we try and... Yeah, of course. Can you guide me to it? Yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> After the Jewson family left Mergate Hall, Neil and Barbara welcomed their new neighbours, Mr and Mrs Williams. It was in 1987 that Neil helped them clear the garden and discovered the sculpture. So we're looking in this undergrowth, in this clearing. Just here? Yes. So this is where Neil hit the statue they hope is by Henry Moore with his strimmer all those years ago. Indeed. It does make sense that work was found here. Betty Jewson had a lot of artist friends that visited here. It makes sense there was work by um, artists that she would have met, as well as her own work found in the garden. And there's a story that Henry Moore visited here as well. Do you know anything more about that? It's not beyond the realms of possibility. They came from the same timeline. They both did sculpture, worked with abstract forms. So yes, um, the, the, I, I think there's a good chance that they would have known each other. It's a very intriguing possibility. <laughs> Since Eleanor and her family moved to Mergate Hall 20 years ago, they found other sculptures in the grounds, works which they think are by Betty Jewson. So these are some of the pieces that have been found in the garden over the years. And these are Betty's works, are they? Betty Jewson's works? We believe works. so. So looking at these, I can see kind of some similarities with Barbara Neal's piece in terms of the forms being organic. Mm. And then some things look completely different. It's reassuring that nothing looks quite like Neil and Barbara's piece, but this might be only a fraction of Betty Jewson's work. So tell me what you know about Betty Jewson. She was a really inspirational woman, I think, and very much within the local community. She founded the Pottergate Gallery, uh, was very instrumental within the contemporary art movement, and a woman as well. Breaking, um, breaking barriers, yeah, wasn't she? Very much so. I mean, I think people forget how difficult it was for women uh, to be uh, making a difference in that, that sort of era. Well, really interesting to see these pieces. And I think if we're going to go on the trail of Henry Moore, we need to find out more about Betty Jewson, the woman and her work. I think you're going to have a very interesting research journey. Back in London, I need some images of Neil and Barbara's sculpture, so I've sent it to a studio which specialises in 3D scanning. The team are using photogrammetry, which is the process of reconstructing 3D models of objects using 2D photographs. This specially designed rig acts as a robotic photographer, capturing hundreds of overlapping images from different angles. These images are then processed with special software to mesh them together. The result is a 3D digital model which can be rotated and viewed from any angle. I now have a, a supreme overall image of Neil and Barbara's sculpture. For anyone studying art these days, it's an invaluable innovation. How could a Henry Moore sculpture end up in the garden of Mergate Hall? According to local history, the artist visited on several occasions. But is that true? It turns out Henry Moore was well connected to this area. In the early 1920s, his family moved from industrial Yorkshire to Norfolk in the hope that the country air would help Moore's ailing father. Moore's sister Elizabeth had already settled in the village of Mulbarton. The young sculptor was living in London, studying and then teaching at the Royal College of Art, but during the holidays he stayed there. And intriguingly, this is just along the road from Mergate Hall. It's so fascinating to think that Henry Moore stayed here with his sister Elizabeth, who lived here with her husband in the old schoolhouse, and he was headmaster at the school just next door. And this is about, what, just a mile and a half from Mergate Hall. And I've got a letter here that he wrote when he was staying at the schoolhouse, written in 1927, and he describes his average day. It's a fascinating account. So he says, up about nine, begin carving about 10, carve for an hour, then stretch my legs, getting a pear or two off the pear tree. Then to it again until 12.30. Lunch and reading the daily news until two. He's got a whole routine going on here. Carve again till four, after which a game of croquet. My aim, he says, is to now increase the hours of carving by cutting down on the croquet and the paper reading. 
just, that's just a brilliant insight. And then we've even got a drawing he did here at the schoolhouse. And I love this bit here. These are all the works I haven't done. So he's got all these in his mind, hasn't got around to them yet. Except this one on the right of the woman stretching her arms up in the air because he did complete that one. And here it is. And what this shows is that Henry Moore was working, sculpting here at Mulbarton, just so close to Mergate Hall. Is it possible that his and Betty Dewson's paths did cross? It's an intriguing possibility. I'm in East London on the hunt for evidence. To find out if Neil and Barbara's sculpture could be a work by Henry Moore, I need to discover how it was made and, crucially, what it's made of. I've sent the piece to Rupert Harris, one of the country's leading sculpture conservators. He conserves works in the Royal Collection and in museums and art galleries all over the world, as well as civic sculptures standing in our towns and cities. Hello, Rupert. Hello, Philip. How nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Let me um, go and get the sculpture for you. Thank you. Rupert has intimate knowledge of the works of Henry Moore, so I'm keen to see what he makes of Neil and Barbara's piece. So you, you, you've had a lot of experience with Henry Moore sculptures, haven't you? A fair amount, yes, yeah. I think we've probably worked on over 60 or 70. We've seen most of his styles right through the period of his life, so I'm very familiar with form, yeah. Now, I'm intrigued to know, what are your first feelings of response to this piece? Well, it has elements that you would say are exactly as Moore would make objects. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly the head, and this, we'll call it the rhinoceros horn. This is very mm -hmm. typical and is seen in, in a large number of Moore sculpture. And the whole bone shape form is something that he repeated time and time again. What do you think of those feet, which look a little bit strange? I haven't seen them, almost like elephants. They are slightly worrying, because normally with these sorts of forms, they would balance naturally on the points of the sculpture rather than having deliberate feet. So they are, they are unusual, without mm. a doubt. Mm. How about the materials? What's it made out of? Well, I think the areas on the top and on the rhinoceros horn are where it's been handled and rubbed, which has exposed the underlying metal, which in this case is, is, has a yellowish tinge to it, which yeah. would indicate a copper alloy, or whether it's a brass or a bronze, I don't know. Um, but the other thing w which I often do with sculpture, all metals have a certain ring to them, and so I would gently tap sculpture, um, and if I tap this... And in this case, it sounds very hard, quite bell-like, and it could easily be a, the sound you would expect from a bronze, rather like a bell. Henry Moore started his career carving stone and wood, but after the Second World War, he embraced the use of bronze. So that could be the sound of bronze that we've just heard, but it doesn't hugely look like bronze to me, not the sort of bronze that I associate with Henry Moore. No, it, it, I would absolutely agree with you. This grey, white finish is very unusual, but I understand that it was a water feature at some point, and if that's the case, and over a long period of time, limescale builds up on bronze, it quite likes bronze, and it could well be that what we're looking at is a bronze sculpture coated in limescale. Now, that's reassuring because that's the thing that's always worried me about this, is, is the materials. So, although at first glance it might not look like it, this could be Moore's favourite metal of, of, of bronze. It could be. So, what we're looking at suggests to you, Henry Moore, but, but the unfathomable part now is exactly what the materials are and how it was made, which could take us closer or further away. Absolutely, yeah. The trail of Henry Moore has led me to the North Norfolk coast. Not far from Wells next to the sea, Moore had another family home. His other sister, Mary, had taken a teaching post in the village of Whiton, and Moore was a regular visitor. The schoolhouse where Moore stayed is now an art gallery and home to Diana Cohen. Hello, Fiona. Diana, how very nice to meet you. Welcome to Whiton. I come see your garden and what you found in it. Let's go round. I've come here because Neil and Barbara aren't the only ones to have made a discovery in a Norfolk back garden. And this is a lovely view. Absolutely lovely, Diana. So is this what you found in the garden? Yes, we were levelling the ground 
and we unearthed this. And Alfred said, this has been worked on. Look, you can definitely see a head emerging. Yeah. And you can see chisel marks. Diana and her late husband, the artist Arthur Cohen, suspected they'd stumbled on the beginnings of a work by Henry Moore, so they decided to show it to him. We went to have tea with Henry Moore one day, and we took it with us in an old Marks and Spencer carrier bag. <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, I remember doing that piece. He said, I broke my best chisel doing that, and I was so cross. He said, how kind of you to bring it back. Thank you, thank you so much. After we'd had tea, my husband said, what a lousy art dealer you are. You find a Henry Moore and you go and give it back to him. <laughs> so you gave it back to him and he remembered making it? He remembered making it, yes, yes. And then years later, we were going to put on a Henry Moore exhibition here at the schoolhouse. And we went down to select the pieces to his house at Munch Hallam. And I told them about this piece and we couldn't find it anywhere. We looked and looked and looked. And then my husband saw it being used as a doorstop. As and he a said, that is our piece, that is it. <laughs> So we had that in the exhibition, and of course then, after that, they gave it back to me. And these chisels, are these Henry Moore's? Yes, we found them in the ground. The handles are rotted away, but there were four chisels we found. We've got some photographs, actually, of him here, very smartly in his bow tie. And always with a cigarette. Yes, as you can see there. <laughs> and working away with this extraordinary view and, and being inspired by the landscape. And of course the ground is full of these stones which inspired him. He had a whole collection of them. Henry Moore said, there is in nature a limitless variety of shapes and rhythms. It was on his visits to Norfolk that he first began collecting flints, bones and natural forms. Actually, when you think about particularly his, his monumental sculptures, you can see those shapes evolving out of these natural forms. Absolutely. And of course, this kind of flint is everywhere, everywhere in Norfolk. Look, it's in the it's house. It's everywhere, in the buildings, everywhere. Every time you dig the ground, you find something. Moore said of his homes in Mulbarton and here in Whiton, I'm thankful for these two spots in Norfolk where I can sit in the open air, cross-legged on patches of grass and chip stone. Well, we don't know how the piece that we're investigating ended up in a Norfolk garden, but the fact that you found this genuine Henry Moore in your garden at least shows us it is possible. And we took it back to him and he identified it and said, yes, it was mine. Well, you can't get a better authentication than that. You certainly If only can't. we could still do that now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm returning to the Henry Moore Foundation to find out about Moore's working methods. Curator Dr. Hannah Hyam is going to show me where many of his ideas began. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Philip. Should we Love, go in? Love to. This is Moore's maquette studio. It was his place of inspiration where he surrounded himself with a myriad of shapes and textures. Moore's collection of found objects, stones, bones and natural forms intermingle with hundreds of maquettes, the plaster models he'd make when experimenting with ideas. It's such a privilege to be in a place like this, to be able to get into so great an artist's mind as this. Yeah, it's an incredible um, place, actually. From 1940 onwards, Henry Moore makes all of his sculpture, his, all of his monumental bronzes that have now become so iconic. They begin in the palm of his hand as one of these sketch models, these little studies, these sculptural studies. And the benefit he found of working in this way was that he could turn it round, he could see his idea from all angles. And he had this wonderful capacity to imagine something on a large scale, even though he was uh, conceiving of it in this uh, small form. And I, I can also see loads of found objects, natural objects as well. Yes, Henry Moore collected natural organic objects throughout his life, be they pebbles on the beach or seashells, bones, um, both unearthed bones, but also even those from the Sunday roast pot, <laughs> and of course flints from the nearby fields which he would pick up on his uh, walks. And they line the shells intermingled in complete uh, meritocracy, really, with his maquettes. And these were the things that inspired so many of his works, and he called this his library of natural forms. So how would he have gone about making 
uh, a monumental work. Very, very often, these natural forms, these found objects, were the inspiration, they were the idea. So sometimes he would add plasticine or plaster to a stone or a bone, and they were experiments. They sometimes ended up being worked up first at this size by Moore, then often with the help of his assistants to a, an intermediary size working model about sort of this uh, sort of size. Um, and then, of course, uh, again, to form those monumental bronzes we're so familiar with. So this was really a kind of encyclopedia of, of Henry Moore's thoughts and experiments and creative processes over a course of a lifetime. The workshop of his mind. Absolutely. It's extraordinary to think that so many famous works by Moore have had their beginnings here. Hannah has given me some time to explore. There's so much here, so much to inspire Henry Moore. I mean, there's literal bone like this. I mean, there's a skull of a rhinoceros, I think, and whalebone. And then there are flints and shells and all sorts of things that that you can imagine with a starting point for ideas that look as though they're almost changing into art as you look at them. And I'm particularly looking for anything that resonates with Neil and Barbara's sculpture. And there's one object there that looks particularly intriguing. I'd love to get a closer look at it. I've asked Neil and Barbara to join me here at Perry Green. I've got something to show them that I hope might bring us closer to Henry Moore. Well, hi again. Hello. 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 So we're surrounded with all of the, the ideas, the thoughts of Henry Moore's sculptures to be. And amongst them all, there is this one that I'd like to show you. Oh, yes, it's got the same feeling yeah, about it. it has. It's got the shape. It's got the shape without the, the, the tooth part, but it's got the shape. It's, it's fantastic. So the question that, that we have to ask is, does this object in some way relate to yours? Could it be the starting point, the, f the flame of a thought yeah. that then becomes yours? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a thought. Mm. What a thought. What, what, what a thought. <laughs> what a thought. <laughs> It is quite mm. amazing, really it is, to think that that could have become that. It makes it all seem a bit more real. Mm. Yeah, it does. Well, we still have an, an awful lot more to, to yes, try and prove. I'm sure. And I feel that in this sort of big task ahead of us, mm. this is a foothold. Mm. Definitely. Are you all right? It's I, quite surreal, just, isn't it? I just ask you to pinch me. It's very mm. exciting, mm. Philip. Fantastic. <laughs> Back at the gallery, we're trying to establish a timeline. To do that, we need to date Neil and Barbara's piece. So if Neil and Barbara's sculpture is by Henry Moore, we've got to work out how it fits into his body of work. And if we can put a date on it, we'll be able to work out when Betty Jusen might have acquired it. Well, I've been looking at Henry Moore's catalogue resume. Look at this. This is from 1940, and intriguingly, it's called Pointed Form, a drawing from metal sculpture. Mm. I mean, there's absolutely no question about it. There's a real resonance in this sculpture of, of images like that, you know, the points and the hollows. Of course, you think that about that. Have a look at this. There's a whole series of them, again, from 1940. Yeah. And one of them was, in fact, made into a metal sculpture. Look at that very distinctive point. Again, this is mm. 1940. Mm. But then, from the same set of drawings, one didn't become a sculpture until nearly 30 years later, in 1968. Yeah, but I suppose that's not altogether surprising, because we do know that Henry Moore would return to his earlier dreams and thoughts, and they would sort of erupt later in his career. Well, a whole series of them erupted, because look at all these. Again, these are all late 60s, all with these distinctive points. Mm. And that raises the question, if Barbara Neal's piece is by Henry Moore, is it from 1940, thereabouts, or mm. from the late 1960s? Well, it could, of course, be 1940s, but it also has, I don't know, a slightly later feel to it. It, it feels that it dates from the late 60s, when all of these, these points were pushing up through his art. But that 
does concern me slightly because if Henry Moore, let's say he gave a sculpture to Betty Jewson in the late 60s, he's yeah. a renowned international superstar at this point. So how did it end up in the garden? Yeah, it does feel a bit odd, doesn't it? Have you managed to establish any more about the link between Henry Moore and Betty Jewson? Well, we've still got that story that sort of local folklore, that Henry Moore visited Betty Jewson at Mergate Hall, but I need to try and find some evidence for that work out if it's true. And then we've still got this thing that is nagging away at me slightly, that Betty Jewson herself was a sculptor. Yeah, and, and I have to say that that's been the back of my mind also. But do we have a, a clearer idea of what her sculpture looked like? Well, I've seen some, also in the garden, and they don't look anything like the sculpture that we're looking at, but I need to see more. To find out more about Betty Jewson's work, I've come to Goldsmiths at the University of London. We know that Betty was a member of the Women's International Art Club, so I'm meeting Una Richmond, who's extensively researched the group. Nice to see you. Hello, welcome. Thank you very much. Their archives are held here in the Women's Art Library. I'm hoping Una can tell me more about the elusive Betty Jewson. So, Una, we know Betty was a member of the Women's International Art Club. What was that? The Women's International Art Club was um, set up in around 1900 and it aimed to provide an opportunity for women artists to, to exhibit because at that time there were few opportunities. And to a certain extent that remained the same for most of the 20th century. And did Betty have to be a sculptor of a certain stature to be accepted into the club? Yes, she did. There was a selection process and we've actually got um, Betty Jewson's application form. It was gone A on it. And that means she was accepted and elected to the club. When Betty was elected in 1973, she was in good company. Famous sculptors Barbara Hepworth and Elizabeth Frink were also members. A year later, Betty was part of a Women's International Art Club exhibition in London. The Feminine Eye, it's called. Gosh, you can't imagine calling, <laughs> calling an exhibition of women's sculptors the feminine no, eye these days, can no. you? And so, oh, right, so this is her piece here, Betty Jewson, Parentage. God, it's hard to see why that's called Parentage, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a profile. Bronze. And it was five inches by five inches, so... What, like that? So pretty tiny, actually. Unlike the piece that we're looking at, which, which is considerably larger. Other exhibition catalogues include more of Betty's works. Will I find anything close to Neil and Barbara's piece? If I do, it could be game over. Dancers, Embrace and Polar Bears. Two in bronze, one in brass. OK, that's interesting to know the material she was working in. But sadly, no images. Those titles certainly don't sound like Neil and Barbara's sculpture. One more catalogue to go. Will Neil and Barbara's piece be listed? So here we go. Betty Jewson, Cock and Eagle, both in bronze. Photographs? I'm afraid oh, not. I'm so desperate to see more images of her work. She was a gallery owner as well, wasn't she? Yes, we have a press cutting of the opening of her Pottergate Gallery in Norwich in October 1973. A former florist in Pottergate, Norwich, has been converted into an art gallery, which intends to become a showcase for contemporary work in the city. And is this Betty here? Yes, with the grey hair. She's pretty redoubtable, actually. Smiling away, though. Betty exhibited her own work at her gallery, and she caught the notice of the Art Review magazine. The sculptures of Betty Jewson are small, competent pieces in bronze and aluminium and show an individual approach, particularly in the interpretation of the horse and rider theme. Horse and rider theme? I mean, that doesn't sound like our sculpture either, like Neil and Barbara's piece. Any more pictures, any further this trail goes? I'm afraid not. I need to see more images of her work if I'm going to try and establish whether there's any chance that she could be the one responsible for Neil and Barbara's sculpture. Derby is our next stop on the trail of Neil and Barbara's sculpture. We need to examine the work forensically, so Rupert and I are heading to a materials testing lab. The facility is equipped with all manner of machines and devices designed to analyse different metals. To determine whether the work is by Henry Moore, we need to find out how it was made and, crucially, what it's made of. 
First, we're using an industrial X-ray to look through the sculpture. This should give us some indication of how Neil and Barbara's piece was constructed. But will it be in keeping with Moore's techniques? Well, 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 this is a surprise. Um, looking at this X-ray, this is a solid casting. Um, the reason I know that is that where you have density, high density, um, you have the white. And normally with a hollow bronze, you would have a cavity inside here, um, which there isn't in this case. You see, that's a surprise to me because when you tapped it earlier, it sounded hollow. That sounds hollow, yeah. but clearly, judging yeah. by the X-ray, it is not. OK, so that's curious, but h how do you think it would have been made, then? I mean, looking at the X-ray. I think it's a sand casting. Sand casting is the process by which a plaster maquette is pressed into sand to create a mould of its shape. Molten metal is then poured into the void to create a solid sculpture. Did Henry Moore use the sand casting process? Yes, he did. Um, many of the foundries he used specialised in sand casting. Um, however, a sculpture of this size, I would normally have expected to be hollow. So it strikes me that this X-ray is showing both good and bad news. We know the process that this was made from is one that Henry Moore used, but the fact that it's solid is a concern. It, it is a concern. So it, it's now, I think, more important than ever to work out what it's made from, and that might take us closer to an answer. It, absolutely, yeah. Our investigation into Neil and Barbara's sculpture has taken a troubling turn. I'm heading west to Devon in search of answers. There's someone I want to meet who I hope can help us answer whether Neil and Barbara's sculpture is a work by Betty Jewson or not. I've managed to track down Betty's son, Ed Jewson. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Good there. to see you. Come this way. Thank you. Ed has several of his mother's works on display in his home and garden. He's gathered them together so I can see whether there's anything similar to Neil and Barbara's piece. Well, Ed, this is a lovely collection of sculptors here. These are all by, by your mother, by Betty. They are. This is rather lovely, I must It's say. lovely. Yes. I mean, this, to me, definitely looks like a horse. Yep. But otherwise, they're very organic shapes, aren't they? Mm. What kind of materials did she use generally? Well, anything from um, bronze, obviously, to uh, the cement fondue, which is something she used quite a lot, through to um, welding together farm implements and so forth. So it was a great variety that she used. I got a photograph of her. Here, there you are. Oh, look at that. There she is, and that was taken in the mid-70s. Right, when she was sculpting. Yeah. And what was Betty like as a character? Character is a good word. She was quite a character and was much loved by all. She had a great laugh, she had a wild sense of humour and um, lived life to the full. I'd like to have met her. She sounds great. I wish you had. We miss her terribly. Let me show you a picture of the sculpture that we are looking at. This is it here. Now, do you recognise it as one of your mother's works? Uh, no, I, I haven't seen it before. Well, they're hoping it's by Henry Moore, so that's good news for Neil and Barbara. I mean, do you... That's very good news, actually. And do you look at this and think it could have been one of your mothers? Well, it's always possible. She was a great follower of Henry Moore and um, really liked the way he sculpted. Because this was found in the long grass at your former home where you grew up at Murgate yeah. Hall, hit by a strimmer. Wow. Bother, if it is by Henry Moore, <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> dear, oh dear. I thought I'd cleared them all up, but obviously I've miss missed that one. Let me ask you about another important connection. There's sort of local folklore, if you like, that Henry Moore visited your home, Betty's home, on, on a number of occasions. Do you remember Henry really? Moore coming to the house? Uh, no, I don't, I'm afraid. OK, so that's less good news. What about, I'm thinking, given that... Uh, your mother was a sculptor and a trained as an artist, and she opened a gallery, of course, the Pottergate Gallery in Norwich. Did she move in the kind of artistic circles where she might have met Henry Moore that way? Well, she could have done. I mean, um, she was a great friend of Augustus John, 
And I think there's some connection between Augustus John and Henry Moore. Because the renowned painter yeah. Augustus John. And in fact, he drew several portraits of my mother, and that's one of them. It's absolutely Lovely, enchanting. Yes, gosh, it is. She looks beautiful, but what a beautiful portrait as well. So she could have met Henry Moore through Augustus John. Oh, I think it's more than possible, yeah. And if, if in the end we do find out that Neil and Barbara's piece, which you missed when you were clearing out the garden at Mergate Hall, yeah, thanks. If, <laughs> if it does turn out to be a Henry Moore, how will you feel about that? Well, um, I mean, obviously, I'd be delighted for Neil and Barbara. Um, it will teach me to clear up after myself. Um, but also, by understanding that my mother was definitely in, co in contention, it shows her work in quite a good light, which, uh, which makes me feel very good. Back at the gallery, I've invited Neil and Barbara for an update. So I've asked you to come here today because I have some news for you. So I met Betty Jewson's son, Ed. First of all, the good news is he does not recognise your piece as being by his mum. That's good. That's a relief, isn't it? Yes, yes. relief. The bad news is he, he has no recollection or knowledge of Henry Moore visiting his mother at Mergay Hall. So we've done a bit of digging. Augustus John, the famous painter. Looks a character. He does, it's a great yeah, picture, isn't it? Mm. Now, he was a friend of Betty Jewson. So was there any connection between Augustus John and Henry Moore? Now, when we looked through some of the archive of Henry Moore, what we found is this letter from the 21st of November, 1979. Now, look at this bit here. This is Henry Moore writing, and he says, I think I met him, Augustus John, around 1928, when I had my first one-man exhibition at the Warren Gallery in London. John bought two or three drawings. So there we've got a, a mm, link. A link. Yeah, yes, between definitely. Augustus John and Henry Moore. Mm. You'll notice he bought drawings, he didn't buy sculptures. Because mm. I was thinking, is it possible that Augustus John bought a sculpture? He knew yes. Betty Jewson, did he yeah. give it Betty Jewson? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't make that no. connection. No. Okay. So, dug a bit further. So here we've got oh. Betty. It's a great picture as oh, well, isn't it? Lovely lady. Brings back a few memories. Yeah, yeah it does. Amazing lady. You remember she had the Pottergate Gallery yes. in yes. Norwich? So here she is, looking very different. Oh, my goodness. Now, this character here, this is Bernard Reynolds. It's a sculptor. OK. This is an exhibition. This is her first oh. exhibition, actually, at the Pottergate Gallery in 1973. Now, Bernard Reynolds was one of Henry Moore's first assistants in 1936. Wow. Yeah. Wow, there's a link there. There's a link there, and that's not the only one. Let me take you back to the Potter Gate Gallery. I want you to look at this man here. OK. Now, this is John Farnham. John Farnham. And John Farnham also <gasps> worked for Henry Moore as one of his assistants. Here he is, Henry yes. Moore, of course. From oh, wow. 1960 until Henry Moore's death in 1986. Mm. And here okay. he is working on one of Henry wow. Moore's sculptures. Not one, but two assistants linked to Betty Jewson, but also crucially linked to Henry yes. Moore. We're so close. That's yeah. incredible. So interesting. Not quite there yet, no. but we're getting closer. Fantastic. Thank you, Fiona. Right. Back in Derby, we're trying to find an answer to a crucial question, one that could solve this mystery once and for all. What is Neil and Barbara's piece made of? Metallurgist Ian Copestake is using X-ray fluorescence, also known as XRF, to detect the elements present. Henry Moore used a variety of materials throughout his career, but his favourite by far was bronze. Strong yet malleable, it allowed him greater freedom to create the monumental sculptures he's famed for. Bronze is an alloy consisting of copper and tin, along with other trace metals. But will the XRF detect these vital elements? Hi, Ian. Hi. So, are we any closer to working out what this is made of? Well, I'm getting copper, I'm getting tin, which are the, the main constituents in bronze, but the tin content isn't really high enough to class it as a, as a bronze alloy. I'm also getting quite a lot of lead, 
and zinc in the analysis. That's slightly problematic because that would indicate a different alloy than, than bronze itself. That's disappointing. Yes, the, the limitations of this instrument, it only is able to see a fraction of a millimeter into the metal surface. So anything that is on the surface will significantly skew. So the, the amount of corrosion on the surface, that would suggest that there is likely to be quite a lot of contamination of the reading that, that Ian's getting. That's correct. The only way to get an accurate reading is to take a sample of the sculpture and analyze it. Only then will we discover what Neil and Barbara's piece is made of. Since we last met, Betty's son, Ed, has been doing his own detective work. Hi, Fiona. Ed, very nice to see you. Very good to see you. He's eager for us to see more of his mother's works, so he's contacted family and friends all over the country to track them down. Ed, wow. I mean, this is an incredible collection. It's quite something, isn't it? I mean, actually, some of these I haven't seen before. There's a wonderful array of abstract shapes in bronze, brass, and aluminium. But I can't help noticing that some of them have the same motifs as Neil and Barbara's piece. Now, looking at these, the point in the center, and looking at Neil and Barbara's, look wow. at the point there. Hmm. There's different similarity, isn't there? Well, there is, but also, I've looked at drawings by Henry Moore in his studio, and this is the kind of thing that Henry Moore was doing. So it's very much a motif of Henry Moore as well. OK. I can't help but be drawn to these two beside me. So this is the plaster maquette, and yep. then this is the bronze here. So look, let's look again at Barbara and Neans. Now, that, think about that knobbly sort mm. of head, if you like. Can you see similarities there? Indeed. Very marked, yeah. But again, this is very much a motif of Henry Moore as well. Yeah. Two artists using the same motifs, one inspired by the other. Can we untangle who created Neil and Barbara's piece? I'm going to put you on the spot now. <laughs> What's your instinct? Well, I hope it's probably my mother, but, um, you know, the jury is out, no doubt. Back in Derby, Rupert and I are heading to a forensic engineering lab. It's equipped with a scanning electron microscope, which should reveal what Neil and Barbara's sculpture is made of. A small sample is placed in the chamber. Electrons interact with the sample, producing signals that can help identify the elements present. Rupert and I are waiting for forensic engineer Arthur Green to process the results. We're finally about to find out whether Neil and Barbara's sculpture is made in a material used by Henry Moore. Hi, Arthur. Hello there. Arthur, hi. So, have you managed to ascertain the metal that Neil and Barbara's sculpture is made of? We have, yes. So we've analysed it using our electron microscope. And um, so I can show you the results now. And as you can see, it's consistent with an aluminium alloy. Aluminium alloy? Yes, that's correct. So that big, red, jagged peak is all aluminium. Yep. Rupert, have you ever heard of Henry Moore using aluminium alloy? The answer is no. It cast in many other metals, but not aluminium, as far as I'm aware. It's not good news, is it? I don't think it's good news, and I think it's quite surprising, really. All along, we anticipated it was going to be a copper alloy of some sort. I thought we were going to be much closer to a metal used by Moore. It's not looking good, is it's it? It's not looking good, no. We've done all that we can. The only option left is to send Neil and Barbara's sculpture and our dossier of evidence to the review panel. It consists of a committee of experts who meet twice a year at Perry Green. And it is they who have the final say as to whether this is by Henry Moore or not. Back at the gallery, the verdict letter has arrived. But while the review panel has been assessing our evidence, some new information has come to light. Well, before we give the verdict to Neil and Barbara, we have to tell them about this latest discovery. I know, but research is research. It's a, it's a two-edged sword, and we've just got to accommodate the facts, whatever they are, as we find them. I mean, the stakes are so high. If this is a Henry Moore, 
It could be worth up to a million pounds. Neil and Barbara are on their way to the gallery. We're all about to hear the decision from the review panel as to whether their sculpture is a work by Henry Moore or not. But first, we need to tell them the latest twist in the tale. Hello. Hello. Hi, Neil and Barbara. Hello. So I've got here the verdict. Okay. But before I tell you what's in there, I just want to share with you some new information that's come to light. After we sent our dossier of evidence to the Henry Moore Foundation, Ed, Betty Jewson's son, went to visit a family relative who he'd not been able to see for over a year because of the lockdown. Right. And while he was there, he found this. Recognise it? <gasps> yes. Henry. He thinks this picture was taken in the garden of his mother's Betty Jewson's gallery, the Potter Gate. OK. On the back of it is written Betty Jewson. And at the bottom, ciment fondu, so cement. Which is odd, because we know that Henry here, as you call it, is not made of cement. Now, Ed thinks that this writing is not his mother's, not Betty's. So whoever wrote this got the materials wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not cement. But whoever wrote it thought it was a work by Betty Jewson. Okay. okay. So that person might be right, might be wrong, can't say. But what it certainly doesn't do is take us any closer to Henry Moore. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we now have another issue that we need to share with you, and that is that we have had the metal tested. And it is not bronze as we had hoped or expected, but it's aluminium alloy. Now, as far as we know, that is not something that Henry Moore ever used. But Betty Jewson did. Okay. But it's not over yet. The odds are stacked against us, but the final decision rests with the Henry Moore Foundation review panel. Do you want to hear the verdict? Definitely. Please. Dear Mr and Mrs Betts, Unfortunately, the panel members are in agreement that the work is not by Henry Moore. I'm sorry not to bring more positive news, and I thank you for bringing this work to our attention. So sorry. Well, it was going to be one or the other, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, for what it's worth, from the first moment I saw that, I was impressed by its presence and, and its boldness. And it hardly surprises me that the Foundation took an interest in it. No. Mm. I've got to admit, I'm gutted for you. I really am. <laughs> no, don't be. The journey's been really the good. The journey's been incredible. We've had such a good time. Mm. It's been lovely. He will go back to being a doorstop again if, and, and a oh. treasured memory, really. And will you still call him Henry? Always. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. He will always be yeah. Henry. I feel so sorry for Neil and Barbara. What a disappointment. And they really took it on the chin, didn't they? On the other hand, I've really enjoyed getting to know Betty Jewson. She was clearly a remarkable woman and a serious talent. And also, it's a reminder of just what a colossal presence Henry Moore was in, in 20th century sculpture and how he created a language that was so potent that it influenced generations of artists. If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece or other precious object, contact us at bbc.co.uk slash fakeorfortune. <laughs>